five and a half term adventure. The five were at Kirin Cottage for a short half-term holiday. For once, both the boys' school and the girls' school had chosen the same weekend. It hardly ever happens that we can spend half-term together. And what luck to have such lovely weather at the beginning of November. Four days off. What shall we do? Bathe. Bathe. What? Bathe? In November? You must be mad. I can't allow that, Julian. Really, I can't. Only joking, Aunt. Don't worry. We haven't got our swimsuits here. Let's walk over to Windy Hill. It's a grand walk, by the sea most of the way. And there may be blackberries and nuts still to find. <coughs> Timmy put his big paw on Dick's knee. He was always hoping to hear that magic word, walk. Yes, let's do that. Aunt Fanny, shall we take a picnic lunch? Or is it too much bother to prepare? Not if you help me. Come along. We'll see what we can find. But remember, it gets dark very quickly in the afternoon now, so don't leave it too late to turn back. The five set off half an hour later, with sandwiches and slices of fruitcake in a knapsack carried by Julia. Dick had a basket for any nuts or blackberries. His aunt had promised a blackberry and apple pie if they did find any berries for picking. Timmy was very happy. He trotted along with the others, sniffing here and there and barking at a curled up hedgehog in a hole in a bank. Now leave it alone, Timmy. You must have learned by now that hedgehogs are not meant to be carried in your mouth. Don't wake it up. It's gone to sleep for the winter. It's a heavenly day for the beginning of November. The trees still have their leaves, all colours, red, yellow, brown, pink, and the beeches are the colour of gold. Blackberries. Dick had caught sight of a bush whose branches were still covered with the black fruit. As soon as the blackberries were seen on bushes here and there, the five slowed up considerably. The blackberries that were left were big and full of sweetness. I say, taste them. They're as sweet as sugar. Mmm, they melt in my mouth. Try one, Timmy. But Timmy spat the blackberry out in disgust. <coughs> manners, Timmy, manners. It was a good walk, but a slow one. They found a hazelnut copse and filled the basket with nuts that had fallen to the ground. Two red squirrels sat up in a nearby tree and chattered at them crossly. This was their nut cops. You can spare us a few. I expect you've got hundreds hidden away safely for the winter. They had their lunch on the top of Windy Hill. It was not a windy day, but all the same, there was a good breeze on the top, and Julian decided to sit behind a big gorse bush for shelter. We'll be in the sun and out of the wind then. Spread out the lunch, Anne. I feel terribly hungry. I can't believe it's only one o'clock, Julian. Well, that's what my watch says. Ham and lettuce together. Just what I like. Get away, Tim. I can't eat with you trying to nibble my sandwich too. It was a magnificent view from the top of the hill. They munched their sandwiches and gazed down into the valley below. A town lay there, comfortably sprawled in the shelter of the hills. Smoke rose lazily from the chimneys. Look, there's a train running along the railway line down there. It looks just like a toy one. It's going to Beckton. See, there's the station. It's stopping there. It really does look like a toy train. Now it's off again. On its way to Kirin, I suppose. Any more sandwiches? What? None? Shame. I'll have a slice of cake then. Hand it over, Anne. They talked lazily enjoying being together again. Timmy wandered from one to the other, getting a titbit here and a scrap of ham there. I think I can see another nut copse over there, the other side of the hill. I vote we go and see what nuts we can find, and then I suppose we ought to be thinking of going home. The sun is getting awfully low, Jew. 
Yes, it is. Considering it's only two o'clock, it's hardly showing above the horizon. Come on, then. Let's get a few more nuts and then we'll go back home. I love that long path winding over the cliffs beside the sea. They all went off to the little copse, and to their delight found a fine crop of hazelnuts there. Timmy nosed about in the grass and brought mouthfuls of nuts to George. Thanks, Timmy. Very clever of you. But I wish you could tell the bad ones from the good ones. I say, the sun's gone and it's getting quite dark. Julian, are you sure your watch is right? It says just about two o'clock still. Gosh, I must have forgotten to wind it up or something. It's definitely stopped now and it must have been slow before. Silly ass. No wonder George thought it was long past lunchtime when you said it was one o'clock. We'll never get home before dark now, and we haven't any torches with us. That cliff path isn't too good to walk along in the dark, either. It goes so near the edge at times. We'd better start back immediately. Awfully sorry about this. I never dreamed my watch was wrong. I tell you what would be a better idea. Why don't we just take the path down into Beckton and catch the train to Kirin? We'll be so late if we walk back, and Mother will be ringing the police about us. Good idea, George. Let's take the path while we can still see. It leads straight down to the town. So away went the five as fast as they could. It was dark when they reached the town, but that didn't matter because the street lamps were alight. They made their way to the station, half running down the main street. Look, there's Robin Hood on at the cinema here. Look at the posters. And what's that on at the hall over there? <coughs> Timmy, come here! <coughs> Oh, he's shot across the road. Come here, Timmy! He's running up the steps of the town hall. <laughs> Look, there's a big dog show on there, and old Timmy must have thought he ought to go in for it. He smelt the dogs there. Come on, let's get him, or we'll lose the next train. The hall was plastered with posters of dogs of all kinds. Julian stopped to read them while George went in after Timmy. Some very valuable dogs here. Some beauties too. Look at the picture of the white poodle. Ah, here comes Tim again, looking very sorry for himself. I bet he knows he wouldn't win a single prize, except for brains. It was the doggy smell that made him go to see what was on. He was awfully cross because they wouldn't let him in. Hurry up. I think I can hear a train coming. They all raced down the road to the station, which was quite near. The train puffed in as they went to the booking office for their tickets. The guard was blowing his whistle as they rushed onto the platform. Dick pulled open the door of the very last compartment and they all bundled in, panting. Gosh, that was a near squeak. Look out, Tim, you nearly had me over. The four children got their breath back and looked round the carriage. It was not empty, as they had expected. Two other people were there, sitting at the opposite end, facing each other, a man and a woman. They looked at the five, annoyed. Anne saw that the woman was carrying a shawled bundle in her arms. Oh, I hope we haven't woken your baby. We only just caught the train. The woman rocked the little thing and crooned to it, covering its head with a shawl. A rather dirty one, Anne noticed. Is he all right? Well, cover her up more. It's cold in here. The woman pulled the shawl tighter. The children lost interest and began to talk. Timmy sat still by George, very bored. Then he suddenly sniffed round and went over to the woman. He leapt up onto the seat beside her and pawed at the shawl. The man shouted at Timmy. Stop that! Get down! Here, you kids, look after that great dog of yours. It'll frighten the baby into fits. Come here, Timmy. George was surprised he should be interested in a baby. Timmy whined and went to George, looking back at the woman. A tiny whimpering noise came from the shawl. Timmy was very disobedient. 
Before George could stop him, he was up on the seat again, pawing at the woman and whining. The man leapt up furiously. Don't hit my dog! Don't hit him! He'll snap at you! Mercifully, just at that moment, the train drew in at a station. Anne opened the door and suggested that they go into another carriage. The four of them, followed by a most unwilling Timmy, were soon getting into a compartment near the engine. George looked crossly at Timmy. Whatever came over you, Tim? You were never interested in babies. Now sit down and don't move. Timmy was surprised at George's cross voice, and he crept under the seat and stayed there. The train came to a little station where there was a small platform and stopped to let a few people get out. It's Sea Green Holt. And there go the man, the woman and the baby. I must say, I wouldn't like them for a mum and dad. It's quite dark now. It's a jolly good thing we caught the train. Mother will be getting worried. It was nice to be in the cosy sitting room at Kirin Cottage again, eating an enormous tea and telling George's mother about their walk. She was very pleased with the nuts and blackberries. They told her about the man and woman and baby too, and how funny Timmy had been pawing at the shawl. He was funny before that, Aunt Fanny. There was a dog show on at Beckton, and Timmy must have read the posters and thought he would go in for it, because he suddenly dashed across the road and into the town hall where the show was being held. <laughs> really? Well, perhaps he went to see if he could find the beautiful little white Pekingese that was stolen there today. Mrs. Harris rang up and told me about it. There was such a to-do. The little dog, which was worth five thousand pounds, was cuddled down in a basket one minute, and the next it was gone. Nobody was seen to take it, and though they hunted in every corner of the hall, there was no sign of the dog. Gracious! What a mystery! How could anyone possibly take a dog like that away without being seen? Easy. Wrap it in a coat, or pop it in a shopping basket and cover it up. Then, walk through the crowd and out of the hall. Or, wrap it in a shawl and pretend it was a baby. Like the little one in that dirty shawl in the train. I mean, we thought it was a baby, of course, but it could easily have been a dog, or a cat, or even a monkey. We couldn't see its face. There was a sudden silence. Everyone was staring at Anne and thinking hard. There's something in what Anne has just said, something worth thinking about. Did anyone see even a glimpse of the baby's face, or hair? Did you, Anne? You were the nearest. No, no, I didn't. I did try to see, because I like babies, but the shawl was pulled right over the face and head. And don't you remember how interested Timmy was in it? He's never interested in babies, but he kept on jumping up and pawing at the shawl. And do you remember how the baby whimpered? It was much more like a little dog whining than a baby, now I come to think of it. No wonder Timmy was excited. He knew it was a dog by the smell. I say, this is jolly exciting. I vote we go to Sea Green Holt and snoop around the tiny village there. No, I will not have that, Julian. It's as dark as pitch outside, and I don't want you snooping around for dog thieves on your half-term holiday. Oh, Aunt! Ring up the police. Tell them what you've just told me. They'll be able to find out the truth very quickly, and they will be sure to know who had a baby and who hasn't. They can go round snooping quite safely. All right. Julian was sad to have a promising adventure snatched away so quickly. He went to the phone, frowning. Aunt Fanny might have let him and Dick slip out to Seagreen in the dark. It would have been such fun. The police were most interested and asked a lot of questions. Julian told them all he knew, and everyone listened intently. Then Julian put down the receiver and turned to the others, looking quite cheerful again. They were jolly interested, and they're off to Sea Green Village straight away in the police car. They're going to let us know what they find. Aunt Fanny, 
We cannot go to bed tonight till we know what happens. Oh, no, please, we can't. can't. Go to bed. Please, please, aunt, please. Oh, can't. Very well. Oh, what a collection of children you are. You can't even go for a walk without something happening. Now, get the cards out and let's have a game. They played cards, listening for the ringing of the telephone. But it didn't ring. Supper time came and still it hadn't rung. It's no go, I suppose. We probably made a mistake. Someone's coming. Listen, it's a car. They all listened and heard the car stop at the gate. Then footsteps came up the path and the front doorbell rang. I'll go. Oh, it's the police. A burly policeman came in, followed by another. The second one carried a bundle in a shawl. Timmy leapt up to it at once, whining. It wasn't a baby then. The policeman smiled and shook his head. He pulled the shawl away, and there, fast asleep, was a tiny white Pekingese, its little snub nose tucked into the shawl. Oh, the darling! Wake up, you funny little thing! It's been doped. I suppose they're afraid of it whining in the night and giving its hiding place away. Tell us what happened, please. Oh, get down, Timmy. George, he's getting too excited. He wants the peak to play with him. Acting on your information, we went to Seagreen. We asked the porter what people got out of the train this evening, and if anyone carried a baby. He said four got out, and two of them were a man and a woman. The woman carried a baby in a shawl. He told us who they were, so away we went to the cottage. We looked through the back window of the cottage and spotted what we wanted at once. The woman was giving the dog a drink of milk in a saucer, and she must have put some drug in it because the little thing dropped down and fell asleep at once while we were watching. Timmy tried to get at the tiny dog again, but nobody took any notice of him. So... In we went, and that was that. The couple were so scared that they blurted out everything. How someone had paid them to steal the dog, and how they'd taken their own baby's shawl wrapped round a cushion, and had stolen the dog quite easily when the judging of Alsatians was going on. They wrapped the tiny dog in the shawl, just as you thought, and caught the next train home. I wish I'd gone down to Seagreen Village with you. Do you know who told the couple to steal the little dog? Yes. We're off to interview him now. He'll be most surprised to see us. We've informed the owner that we've got her prize dog all right, but she feels so upset about it she can't collect it till the morning. So, we wondered if you'd like to keep it for the night. Your Timmy can guard it, can't he? Oh, yes. Oh, Mother, I'll take it to my room when I go to bed, and Timmy can guard the tiny thing as much as he likes. He'll love it. Well... If your mother doesn't mind you having two dogs in your room, that's fine. Give her the dog, Bert. The second policeman gave George the dog in the shawl. She took it gently, and Timmy leapt up again. No, Tim. Be careful. Look what a tiny thing it is. You're to guard it tonight. Timmy looked at the little sleeping Pekingese, and then... Very gently, he licked it with the tip of his pink tongue. This was the tiny dog he'd smelt in the train, covered in a shawl. Oh, yes, Timmy had guessed at once. I don't know what your name is, little dog, but I think I'll call you Half-Term Adventure. Though I don't know what that is in Pekingese. <laughs> <laughs> well, good night, madam. Good night, children. Mrs. Fulton, the dog's owner, will call tomorrow for her peak. He won a thousand pound prize today, so I dare say you'll get some of that for a reward. Good night. The five didn't want a reward, of course. But Timmy had one for guarding the little peak all night. It's on his neck. The finest studded collar he has ever had in his life. Good old Timmy. Timmy.